Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, on behalf of the Pembroke Center and my fellow graduate organizers, I was going to say friends, <laughs> my friends, <laughs> Tara Holman, Christopher Lasasso, and Shimalori Sabande, I'm equally parts honored and astonished to be introducing our keynote speaker, the tremendous C. Riley Snorden. Jointly appointed in the Departments of English Language and Literature and the Center for Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Chicago, Professor Snorden is a prodigious cultural theorist whose work gathers the fields of Black Studies, Gender and Sexuality Studies, Critical Race Theory, and among others still, the study of visual culture and iconography. Indeed, in the course of his multidisciplinary work on racial, sexual, and transgender histories and cultural productions, Professor Snorden has been the recipient of a litany of awards, too numerous and too varied in type to name, though we must name a few. From the John Boswell Prize from the American Historical Association <clears throat> to the William Saunders Scarborough Prize from the Modern Language Association to the Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Nonfiction, and to the Sylvia Rivera Award in Transgender Studies for the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies. Professor Snorden is the author of such celebrated and incisive texts as No One Is Nobody's Supposed to Know, Black Sexuality on the Down Low, published in 2014, and the groundbreaking Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity, published in 2017. He is also the co-editor of the 2020 anthology, Saturation, Race, Art, and the Circulation of Value, as well as also in 20, since 2020, the co-editor of GLQ, a journal of LGBTQ studies. Least to take a break, Professor Snorden has another monograph in the works tentatively titled Mud, Ecologies of Racial Meaning, as well as in partnership with the brilliant Professor Margot Natalie Crawford, a co-edited forthcoming work of special importance to us today, The Flesh of the Matter, a Hortense Spiller's reader. But permit me to back up for just a moment as a roundabout way of proceeding onward, for as I imagine every grad student in this room can attest, there is only few things more flustering than the prospect of being asked to speak about Professor Spillers, and that is to be asked to do so in front of her, along with any measure of wit or style. Two qualities that unfortunately for me in this particular moment, but fortunately for all of us as readers of her work, Professor Spillers possesses like few others, especially for being an academic. To begin at the beginning then, resolved instead to cast my lot with earnestness, let me say that there is no better word than astounding to describe the series of moments which have led to our gathering with and among such talent today. Beyond a desire to celebrate Professor Spiller's work and to gather with other early career and independent scholars and artists to study and share in her influence, my co-organizers and I could have never predicted the magnitude, as you've heard many times today already, of what this symposium would become. After shyly bringing our idea for the symposium to the Pembroke Center and sharing our modest imaginings of what it might entail, Tara, Christopher, Simaloria, and I were met with an off-the-cuff comment that quickly came to shape the trajectory of the rest of our planning. Said in jest as a parting comment toward the close of one of our early and numerous Zoom meetings, we were lovingly needled by a playful Wendy, quote, you guys can think bigger, quote. And oh, did we take her up on her word. What began as a modest vision turned into Professor Snorton graciously accepting our request to deliver the keynote despite the fact that we did indeed cite his own tweet about Professor Spillers back to him in the email soliciting his participation. <laughs> <clears throat> then, emboldened as we were, it turned to the likes of Professor Crawford, Professor Abdur Rahman, Professor Roach, and Professor Kwashi, and our postdoctorate fellows, uh, Adrian Hernandez Acosta, Megan Finch, and Donald Brown generously offering us their time and skill. Then of course, in the most astonishing, <clears throat> astonishing moment of them all, astonishing both for the fact of it as well as the manner of its relay in the sort of cool, breezy tone of earned casualness that comes only from familiarity and that among us only Mary and Amanda alone could ever dare to pull off, we were informed that Professor Spillers herself would be attending. And so finally, still as astonishingly as ever, we have finally made it here in a room full of people whose common bond at bottom is clear, that each of us in our own ways understands ourselves to be a student of Spillers, 
that whether or not this is, as it is for me and the co-organizers, the first instance of being in her presence, so unparalleled is the reach of her study and indeed the study of her cohort of black feminist scholars that we are, to this day, still indebted, still responding, still inspired. When asked not too long ago what she thought of the way her work was being interpreted by contemporary black and queer scholars and of how in considering black feminist studies moving forward, she'd like for her and her work to be represented. <clears throat> Professor Spillers replied, quote, you know, the thing that I've always been very pleased about is that things keep moving, right? On and on into the next step or the next manifestation. That's precisely what should happen. And the work of my generation of black women, if it has any usefulness, I think that will be its usefulness. That it will simply disappear into the stream of what we recognize as our future, right? The next step, the next intellectual movement. And so as we keep working towards and for that time that can be capacious enough, well enough, for Spillers' work to, as she says, with that inimitable acuteness, quote, simply disappear, into the stream of a future that will be ethical enough to bear it as fact and foundation, what could be more fitting on the 40th anniversary of the seismic event that was Professor Spiller's initial delivery of Interstice's A Small Drama of Words at Barnard, that this keynote address for a symposium in celebration of our oeuvre might yet be titled Thinking Gender at the Interstice. And that more fittingly still, amidst this talk of generations and legacy, that it might be delivered by such a fine and careful student of her work, himself a model to entire new scores of students looking to contribute to this vital thinking. Naming the impetus, beh impetus behind his path-making study of, quote, the transitive and transversal relation, quote, between blackness and gender vis-a-vis -a, -vis a trans analytic, Professor Snorden writes, quote, black on both sides, then, is an attempt to write in and about what Spillers describes in interstices as, quote, the historical moment when language ceases to speak, the historical moments at which hierarchies of power simply run out of terms. A Spillerian grammatician through and through then, and indeed is a more virtuosic, difficult thing to be, Professor Snorden's study of practice is anchored to the imperative evoking Professor Spiller's provocation in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, in his own words, quote, to take seriously what it would mean to take gender to be a place of cultural and political maneuver. Indeed, as the place through which, in Professor Snorton's words, what might come into view is precisely the means with which, quote, to the means with which to, quote, articulate lines of thought and ways of being that exceed capture in language, history, or metaphysics. Certainly then, the sort of tremendous scale of thinking best suited to a fine student of such a fine philosopher. Now, please join me, Tara, Shimalori, Christopher, and the Pembroke Center in our welcoming of our esteemed keynote speaker, Professor C. Riley Snorton. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> I always say introductions are undoing. Um, <laughs> and that one really took me out. Thank you so much, Kieran, for that incredibly, incredibly generous introduction. Um, how, how exhilarating, how exciting, how humbling um, to be present at this symposium um, gathered in a uh, joyful celebration and study of Persp Professor Spiller's um, work and life. I also want to um, thank all the organizers, um, Tara, Kieran, Christopher, and uh, Similore, um, and as well as to thank folks at the Pembroke Center, uh, Wendy, um, Mary, and Amanda, the archivist, uh, Diane, who was my point of contact around the kind of logistics of care. Obviously, thank you to Professor Spillers, whose life and work uh, has made this gathering possible. And uh, thank you to the presenters. Uh, that panel, um, you know, has me all synapses firing. It was incredible. Uh, so who've th those who have come earlier today and all of those who will come tomorrow. Um, the talk I prepared uh, today brings together several ongoing scholarly fascinations, uh, which I was not able to write about in Black on Both Sides, 
Um, and this essay it will appear in the anthology, The Flesh of the Matter, which I am co-editing with my uh, dear colleague and friend, uh, Margo Natalie Crawford, um, and in collaboration with Professor Spillers. Uh, the questions I pose here also animate some of the thinking in my next book, Mud, Ecologies of Racial Meaning. Allow me to begin with an anecdote about the classroom. Having taught in women, gender, and sexuality studies programs for the last decade, I've often assigned Horton Spiller's noted essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American grammar book, and rarely without coupling it with her essay, Interstices, A Small Drama of Words, which was first delivered at a talk at the 1982 Barnard Conference on Sexuality, roughly five years before Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe appears in print. I organize my syllabus in this way to highlight how the material and the symbolic are transitive in Spillersian thought. But interstices also help students to understand how, as Spiller suggests, sexuality is the locus of great drama, perhaps the fundamental one. And as we know, wherever there are actors, there are scripts, scenes, gestures, and reenactments both enunciated and tacit. And if, as Spillers compellingly argues across both of these essays and elsewhere that black women exist in the interstice of official discourses of sexuality, that is, they function, quote, both as that which allows us to speak about and that which uh, enables us to speak at all, then the interstice becomes a crucial space for encountering and interpreting sexuality and gender as intertwined racializing projects, the discourse of which continue, at least in part, uh, to produce a national grammar. But from a literary and philological perspective, Spiller's work invites us to critically engage and generate as necessary a vocabulary that attends to and supplants the dominant grammars of American life by contending with the actual realities of American women in their pluralistic ways of being, with a sharpened integrity integrity of thought and feeling. To deal in actualities, as it were, is to keep a keen eye on how power shapes our experiences of the everyday and the ephemeral, as they inflect the archive and concomitantly the narratological tools and strategies one uses to render life's meanings. As Spillers relates, we are, after all, talking about words, as we realize that by their efficacy, we are damned or saved. Ever inspired, always inspired. In fact, the biggest compliment I've ever received is to be a careful student of her work. This paper proceeds in three parts, beginning with a discussion of the near-do-well genderless pronoun, thon, a contraction of that one that also includes an alternate meaning of that yonder, by the late 19th century and until the mid 20th century, Thawne captivated philological audiences, inspiring much debate and appearing in dictionaries, crossword puzzles, and newspapers. The second part extends the spatial and temporal dimensions of Thawne in a reading of a relatively famous figure in military history, often described as the first black woman to serve in the US military but as archival sources bear out, was variably named and lived a multiple of genders. The third and final part is a meditation on imagination, revision, and method. Or put differently, it's a contemplation of the actualities that trouble certain symbolic assumptions that undergird feminist and sexual, sexual discourse. In a reading of the character Cuffy in uh, James Samuel's The Harder They Fall, uh, released on Netflix in 2021. So let's get going. That one, that yonder, and then. Thon was not the first proposed genderless pronoun in English. Earlier examples included ooh, a dialect word, suggested by the Scottish economist James Anderson in 1792, and it, suggested by Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1808. The oldest and most extensively used pronoun in the third person singular, they, which has been used continuously for six centuries and disparaged more recently for such use for about two. 
the Oxford English Dictionary traces singular they back to 1735, where it appears in the medieval romance, William and the Werewolf. The editors at Funk and Wagnall's first included Thawne in Wagnall's Standard Dictionary of the English Language, volume two, 1897. The entry contained both description and rationale. Thawne, that one, he, she, or it, a pronoun of the third person, common gender, a contracted and solidified form of that one. As a substitute, in, case, in, in cases where the use of a restrictive pronoun involves either inaccuracy or obscurity, or its non-employment necessitates awkward repetition. Thon remained in Funk and Wagnall's publication for the majority of the 20th century and appeared in other sources, including in Merriam-Webster's Second International Dictionary in 1934 with the more succinct definition, a proposed genderless pronoun of the third person. The words creator, Charles Crozat Converse, was a seeming jack of all trades, a philologist, an attorney, an inventor, and a composer, most notably setting to music Joseph Scriven's poem, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Born in 1832 in Warren, Massachusetts, Converse studied law and music in Leipzig, Germany, and received his law degree from Albany Law School in 1861. Many of his musical compositions were published under anagrammatic pen names C.O. Nevers, Carl Redden, and E.C. Revens. While Converse is credited for coining the term in the midst of the Civil War in 1858, he would formally propose consideration among the reading audience of The Critic and Good Literature, a New York-based magazine of literary criticism, in a letter to the editors published in August of 1884. Converse began his letter that a new pronoun of the singular number and a common gender is needed in the English language is a fact patent to every English speaker and writer. Yet it was the philological atmosphere, which he described as full of winged words that aim to produce a minimum of word body with a maximum of flying power, that Converse credits as encouragement for bringing thawn forward as a term for wide adaptation. The proposal prompted much discussion. Well-known philologist Francis A. Marsh described Thon as, quote, a very happy suggestion and expressed his hope that it may be received favorably and in due time adopted. Harvard professor of art Charles Eliot Norton wrote to Converse about Thon, such a pronoun would undoubtedly be a convenience did it exist. The difficulty lies in its being yours. All forms of speech have grown, and I do not recall an instance of the use by a civilized race of any word, not a noun or a verb, deliberately invented by a philologer, however ingenious. Among its critics, some worried that Thawne would be confused with thou, which was not in especially high circulation even at the time. One particularly adamant uh, naysayer called Converse a grammatical crank, and warned that Thon would drastically increase the cost of already overpriced school books. Students would need new grammars, spellers, geographies, and arithmetics. Even blank copy books would be affected, he said. So fearing that, and I'll continue, fearing that America would become a nation of Quakers as to speech, perhaps because Converse was a resident of Erie, Pennsylvania at the time, this critic went on to suggest that Thon would be exported, should be exported to France, quote, where they have no neuter gender. One might hear in this critic's claims at least one implication of gender as constitutive to English's American grammar, offering evidence as to how grammar as the study or use of rules about how words change their form and combine with others to express meaning is also a set of hegemonic social and cultural techniques shaping and shaped by a national project. It is, after all, not Quaker, a religion that affirms equality within and among difference, particularly as it pertains to gender, and according to this critic, ultimately unnecessary for English speakers though apparently could be of value in an imperial exchange with France. Incidentally, the French pronouns lo in the singular and zo in the plural were introduced as third-person genderless pronouns by Joaquim de 
De Velenevenu in 1765, nearly a century before the coining of Thon. It is important to keep in mind that Thon, as Converse proposed, was not an attempt to address the problem of gender, but a problem of language. It's roughly one century of usage from the Civil War era in, uh, to 1961, when it was removed from English language dictionaries, prompts a question about its decline at a critical moment in racial and sexual justice movements in the United States, in which the word may have been put to use by politically fomented communities looking to create other enunciative possibilities and meanings. It was, after all, in 1965 that Dr. John Olivan was credited with coining the term transgender, or more precisely, entering the term into sexological discourse in his book, Sexual Hygiene and Pathology, which is, far, which is, a far belated, which is far belated to global understandings of gender transformation as produced through media coverage of figures such as Lucy Hicks Anderson or Christine Jorgensen. Yet the critics' concern over the revolutionary potential of Thon as a catalyst for the rewriting of grammar and geography is in one sense not overstated. As previously mentioned, Thon has other meanings as a contraction of that yonder and as a variation of then. The spatial and temporal dimensions of Thon's alternate definitions invite an understanding of pronouns not as a descriptor of persons, but in terms of a distant horizon which may have occurred in the past or exists as a future potentiality. Put differently, Thon suggests the not yet and as yet of gender. It brings forth other considerations about how one engages with others as it holds as an open question the where and when of a person rather than the who or what of a person or thing. In this way, Thon implies a relational uncertainty. To be clear, I've not chosen to share this very brief history of Thon in order to advocate for its recirculation. <laughs> rather, I am interested in what Thon could reveal or at least repose about gender and grammar wherein gender is not binary or even proliferative, but situational, relational, and context specific. Here, in the obsolete uses of Thon, we might clear some ground to await whatever marvels of our own inventiveness. But allow me to approach this from a different angle by attending to the scant military records of Private William Cathay whose roughly two years of military service has been the fodder for national memorialization and popular reimagining. In doing so, I hope to make clearer the implications of thinking about non-binary in terms of an approach that concedes how gender is an unfinished project of hegemony. Preconditions. On November 15th, 1866, a 22-year-old William Cathay and two companions enlisted in the U.S. Army in St. Louis, Missouri. It's also um, uh, not lost on me that today is Veterans Day, so this is very wild. And so we're talking about uh, a whole host of, of different markers. Right? Um, yes, so described by the recruiting officer as five feet nine inches tall with black eyes, hair, and complexion, William was assigned to Company A of the 38th Infantry, one of several battalions of Buffalo soldiers tasked with protecting settlers, controlling the native population of the plains, capturing cattle rustlers and thieves, and guarding stagecoaches, wagon trains, and railroad crews along the Western Front. Like all new recruits, William was subject, was subject to a medical exam upon entry and declared by the examining surgeon to be, quote, free from all bodily defects and mental infragility, which would in any way disqualify him from performing the duties of a soldier. By all historical accounts, William Cathay's just under two years of military service was unremarkable. His company never saw direct battle, and rheumatism and neuralgia caused William to spend several months in the infirmary. As a soldier, William was never signaled out for praise or punishment, but Cathay, 
is invariably named in military histories as the first black woman to serve in the US Army. In a first-hand account to the St. Louis Daily Times, published in 1876, Cathay explained how illnesses framed her service, beginning with contracting smallpox shortly after enlisting. Quote, finally, Cathay professed, I got tired and wanted to get off. I played sick, complained of pains in my side and rheumatism in my knees. The post-surgeon found out I was a woman and I got my discharge. The men all wanted to get rid of me after they found out I was a woman. Some of them acted real bad to me, end quote. On October, on October 14th, 1868, William Cathay and two other privates were discharged at Fort Bayard on a surgeon's certificate of disability. William's certificate included statements from both the captain of the company and the post assistant surgeon. The captain's statement read that William, since under his command has been, quote, feeble both physically and mentally and much of the time quite unfit for duty, the origin of his infirmities is unknown to me. The surgeon's statement claimed Cathay was of, quote, a feeble habit. He is continually on sick report without benefit. He is unable to do military duty. This condition dates prior to enlistment. It would appear that the scandal of Williams' assigned sex at birth was not documented in the official military and medical record, as both captain and surgeon statements refer to an unknown prior cause or condition, a foreshadowing of Cathay's disparaged disability benefits claim, which brought their life into public view. As told to the St. Louis Daily Times, Cathay began military service as a girl when she was carried off to Little Rock, Arkansas by Colonel William Plummer Benton of the 13th Army Corps. Both born near Independence, Missouri to an enslaved mother and a free man, Cathay was conscripted into service as a cook uh, after her enslaver died at the beginning of the Civil War. On the circumstances of the first term of service, she shared, I did not want to go. And under Benton, Cathay traveled through various parts of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Georgia, and was eventually sent to Washington City where she served as a cook and launderer for General Sheridan and his staff, with whom Cathay continued to travel through Virginia and Iowa until stationed in Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, Missouri for some time. From enslavement to military conscription and service, the circumstances of Cathay's disabilities is indicative of the biopolitical logic of will to not let die, wherein debility, or what Jasper Poor has identified as the right to maim, acts as a complementary logic to the right to kill and nests within what Saidiya Hartman describes in terms of the violence constitutive to female gender as a locus of both unredressed and negligible injury in the application of US law to the enslaved. After being discharged, Cathay lived in New Mexico, traveled to Fort Union and later to Pueblo and Trinidad, Colorado, while working intermittently as a cook or launderer. At some point in late 1889 or early in 1890, Cathay was hospitalized in Trinidad for nearly a year and a half. And as Deanne Blanton explains, she was probably indigent when she left the hospital, so she filed in June of 1891 for an invalid pension based upon her military service. The original application gave Cathay's age as 41 and made reference to military service-related deafness, rheumatism, and neuralgia. In July, Cathay submitted a supplemental affidavit, which mentioned the case of smallpox contracted at the beginning of their service. On September 9, 1891, a medical doctor acting on behalf of the Pension Bureau described Cathay as 5'7", 160 pounds, and 49 years of age. He reported that she could hear a conversation and therefore was not deaf, and that there were no physical changes in her joints, muscles, or tendons to indicate rheumatism or neuralgia. The doctor also noted that the complainant walked with the aid of a cane as all toes had been amputated. If he asked, the report, if he asked uh, the report did not indicate the cause of the amputations, and apparently the doctor did not know that neuralgia was a problem of the nerves and not the muscles. The use of female pronouns in the doctor's report marks the first usage in reference to William Cathay's military service. 
It would recur in February 19, 1892 when the Pension Bureau rejected Cathay's claim on the grounds that no disability existed. At this point, we find ourselves neck deep in contradictions provide, produced by the gaps and silences in the archive. And yet the imperative here is not to get to the bottom of it, but rather to hold and, and bear witness to the complexities of an assemblage of materials meant to convey a singularity of person, but who themselves seem to demand consent to be a plural being. We know that Cafe went by William and also by Kate Williams and John Williams and James Cady. That Cafe was briefly married and separated that they seem to always be on the move. The descriptions of what happened to Cathay following their denied claim varies widely. Some hypothesize that Cathay lived just one year past their denied claim. Others suggest that they established a school or boarding home in Trinidad, Colorado or Raton, New Mexico. Those who knew them uh, claim that the image that accompanies Cathay Williams' Wikipedia entry of a figure in profile wearing a bonnet, long skirt, starched collared shirt, and workman's jacket is actually a photo of Cathay's mother, Martha, in front of an orphanage and old folks home for black folks in Pueblo. In addition to the demands to materially provide for themselves and their loved ones, their movement was perhaps pr precipitated in part by a desire to find a location of irreducibility to find a place where Cathay did not first have to be a thing for others, to exist in and as Thon. Aside from the two-paragraph article on Cathay in the St. Louis Daily Times, there is no record of what Cathay thought about things. As a Spilersian and Black trans feminist scholar, I have offered a reading of Cathay not to make them into another object of another study, I'm also not suggesting that Cathay would have understood themselves to be trans or non-binary, even as I feel a resonance. Rather, I've attempted, in Spiller's words, to, quote, return the metaphors of experience to their original grounds of tangible and material meaning, to travel the distance between the status of the protected and that of the unprotected, or the difference between sex and sexuality, end quote. The various ways they have been revisited in monument, literature, and popular culture also indicate a relationship between the interstitial and the symptomatic, in which the impetus to remember them seems to reiter reiteratively confer and confirm them in a gendered telos not borne out in the archive. Attempts to valorize the variably named cafe include a bust of their imagined likeness, at the Buffalo Soldier Monument in Leavenworth, Kansas. A third of a room is also dedicated to the story of their military service at the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum in Houston. In 2018, Sarah Bird's novel, A Daughter of a Daughter of a Queen, was published as a, quote, tribute in fiction to the inscrutable Cathay. And in 2021, they were the source material for the transmasculine character, Cuffy, in Netflix's The Heart of a Fall. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Uh, as I said, circulating began circulating on Netflix in 2021. Drawn from the full idiomatic expression, the bigger they fall, the harder they, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, is the first feature-length film directed and co-written by London-based writer, director, and singer-songwriter James Samuel. Plot, setting, and characterization evince the kind of play permissible within the spaghetti western as outlaws and lawmen outsmart and outmuscle each other in the ambiguous past of the U.S. West. In an article published in the Los Angeles Times, Samuel explains about the film, quote, on the surface, the harder they fall is a revenge story, a man hunting down the killer of his parents. Beneath that, however, it's much deeper. It's a love story about two men caught in a never-ending cycle of violence because of their loss. It's a story where both the hunter and hunted are essentially the same person, only to have a final confrontation with tears. As a love story between half-brothers, 
The film implores us to think again about the psychosocial plot and implications of Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, a phrase which Spillers discusses in her interstices essay as a folk saying from her childhood that as it pertains to feminist discourse is suggestive of what it means to know the seductions of the father and who in fact the father is in order to help the subject to know wherein she occasionally speaks when she is least suspecting. As Spillers explains, that the feminist writer challenges certain symbolic formations of the past in correcting and revising them does not destroy the previous authority, but extends its possibilities. By reopening the lines of a prior closure, feminist writers at once define a new position of attack and lay claim to a site of ancestral imperative. Do feminist revisionary acts uh, as a result become futile? No. And, and actually, uh, Professor Spillers, your turn of phrase is much more beautiful here, but um, for the sake of being, it was a negative in response. Um, my point is that the analytical discourse that feminists engage in different ways and for different reasons must not only keep vigil over its procedures, but must also know its hidden and impermissible origins. As a caution against reimagination as the answer to analytical, historical, and aesthetic absence or excess, Spillers invites us to consider the procedural alongside their hidden and impermissible origins. However well-meaning, an intervention may very well extend previous authorities' reach, and Samuel's film, as a mythopoetical instantiation of black presence in the West, is helpful for charting Spiller's concerns across a different, though not unrelated, visual and discursive terrain. Before the film commences, a note reads, while the events of the story are fictional, these people existed, um, which was also made into uh, the copy for an ad campaign, including the images of some of the film's biggest stars. As film critic A.O. Scott suggests in his New York Times review, this isn't about historical accuracy or even realism, it's about genre. Scott continues, the point is that the vivid assortment of gunslingers, chanteuses, salon keepers, and train robbers, all of them black, who ride through picturesque mountain ranges and frontier towns, have, an authentic, have as authentic a claim on the mythology of the West as their white counterparts. They exist, in other words, as true archetypes in a primal story of revenge, greed, treachery, and courage. Whether they existed, which is often the catalyzing truth of recuperative histories, is only one of many questions to address, as audiences are asked to imagine what kind of encounters might have taken place between famous and lesser known black historical figures. Among the cast of characters reimagined for the film, the first black deputy U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi River, Bass Reeves, played by Delro Delroy Lindo, Rufus Buck, played by Idris Elba, the no notorious leader of an outlaw native and black gang, the formerly enslaved cowboy Nat Love, played by Jonathan Majors, and Mary Fields, played by Zazie Beetz, also known as Stagecoach Mary and Black Mary, who was the first African-American woman to serve as a star root mail carrier in the United States. Within the first 15 minutes of the film, audiences are introduced to Cuffy, played by Danielle Deadweiler, as the bouncer at Stagecoach Mary's saloon. Described in the screenplay as, quote, a smooth-cheeked young bouncer in a sharp vest, hat, and crisp shirt, and as soft-spoken and smoothly confident, audiences soon witness Cuffy's fighting skills as Cuffy dispenses with two would-be patrons who have refused to remove their firearms before entering the saloon. The screenplay does not make any mention of the character's gender and uses he slash him and she slash her to refer to Cuffy at different moments in the script. However, Cuffy is also subject to a particularly long and pointed look from Nat Love, who seems both impressed and bemused by Cuffy's skills and stature. It is also through a series of furtive glances between Nat, Mary, and Cuffy that audiences begin to understand that a love triangle, triangle exists between them. Cuffy is later revealed to be Cathay Williams through an uncomfortable scene of off-screen undress and a later scene of Cuffy cross-dressed in women's attire and pressed to share their real name. 
To the question, Cuffy responds, Cuffy my real name. Name I was born with is Cafe Williams. While film critics are firmly divided on whether the film is a quote, positive portrayal, which precipitates the question of what? Uh, of the historical figure, right? Of trans masculinity, gender fluidity, queerness. Uh, the film lays bare the difficulties of representing the past. Cuffy as Kathy is feminized, which is in keeping with the impulse of dominant historiography in which they are represented as a black woman with no apparent gender trouble. As Kaji Amin has argued, no one is binary. <laughs> it's an idealized opposite of non-binary, not a lived state of being. And yet the reiterative representation of Cathay as femme prompts a question about how tacit assumptions about gender construct the grounds of public memory. Furthermore, histories of slavery, indenture, and displacement that catalyze each of the historical figures' movement toward and within the U.S. West also shapes their ways of relating. These histories seem to loom largest in the film's concluding scene in which stagecoach Mary and Cuffy share a brief and very chaste kiss before departing from one another. Mary with Nat and Cuffy with Bass Reeves who explains, quote, I kinda always wanted to be a sheriff, deputy, marshal person. Perhaps the conclusion is a nod to William Cathay's military service, and in keeping with the referent, perhaps we can imagine how law enforcement was not about a sense of belonging or fidelity to the state, but rather a location from which to do more fugitive living. Recalling that audiences met Cuffy as a bouncer in Stagecoach Mary's salon, saloon, one must suppose that the character is experienced at, if not also interested in enforcement, but it's not clear what Cuffy is protecting. Maybe Mary and the staff, maybe a sense of self, maybe all of the above, or something else altogether. To be clear, I'm not condemning the film for its inaccuracies, but rather drawing our attention to the implications of the not uncommon practice of implotting history and the various ways it has the potential to obscure how historical figures lived out their genders and sexualities in an expanse of prohibitions, freedom and unfreedom, desire, and perhaps most importantly, uncertainty. As scholars engaged in black feminist, queer, and trans history and criticism, we know that to tell these stories, to find them, is often to read against what has been given in the archive, as it is also to hold uncertainty closer than knowing, to affirm our subject's right to opacity, to honor both the, the plurality of being and the plurality of truth. Yet, plurality is not the only point that I intend to make here at the conclusion. As film, critics and theor as film critic and theorist Bill Nichols suggests, a film is stylistic before it's grammatical, as it conjoins in style and narrative two basic modes of communication, the analog and the digital. To read Spiller's caution to attend to the procedural alongside its hidden and impermissible origins with the several couplets in Nichols' formulation of cinema, style and grammar, style and narrative, and analog and digital, is to contend with the interplay of the continuous and the discrete, the fantastical problematic of history as a program of change over time, and the promise and very real fact of rupture. Put differently, we are once again pursuing a question about grammar and the interstice, to which, and to pull the three parts together, I am making a methodological, nay, ethical proposal about endeavoring to stage a plausible win, W-H-E-N. That is, to approach the drama cum business of sexuality and gender in ways that hold open possibilities of emergence in the yonder and then. Then we might actively engage in the procedures of unsettling the grounding assumptions of the human subject who stand on sexuality stage. It is, after all, just words, as we continue to live out and through our variegated yet shared social destiny. Thank you, and my profound gratitude to Professor Spillers.
Um, first, I'd like to say thank you because this was really just a lovely um, paper and talk. Um, I was really holding on to what you were talking about in terms of like um, the demands of consent to be a plural being and this idea of a lo inhabiting a location of irreducibility um, and how it is that maybe film at points uh, is taking that up. Um, I'm really curious about how you feel as though media in particular, things like film, things like TV, I'm also thinking about P-Valley, um, if anybody's seen it, because I'm very obsessed with that show, um, how it is that they're taking up this business of gender and um, what the importance is of like actually inhabiting gender as a kind of performance and what it is, how it is that, because I originally heard what you said as staging a win instead of a when <laughs> as well. Like what is it, what would it even mean to stage a win for like, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the plurality of black gender, um, especially in these in this kind of media that is being produced now that wasn't being produced like when um, uh, William Cathy uh, Cathy actually existed. So I'm very just curious about that. That wasn't a very good question, but if you're thinking around like what you feel the responsibility is around media currently to kind of like stage gender. No, thanks. Thanks so much for that question. And and it you know. Reading the talk after hearing the previous panel, there were so many new notes that I was hearing. Um, you know, I think about, uh, in some ways, part of turning to The Harder They Fall was about doing justice to this figure that has been remembered often, and who I also think has been remembered in ways that are um, for, other serv other other purposes or other services. And so, you know, I, I've gone down the kind of rabbit hole of understanding a little bit more about who James Samuel is and how he came to um, identify these particular figures. Um, incidentally, every uh, every char main character that is um, imaged in the film as a black woman has a queer s story. Um, and that queer, but that queer story is also a story about, I mean, in the case of Stagecoach Mary, as uh, Candace Lyons has, has really um, excavated, you know, the, the relationship, the queer relationship that um, she had was with her enslaver's sister. And so the, the fact that the film is also obfuscating the kind of context of uh, slavery uh, indenture, I think is, is one that I, am finding um, in some ways a really grounding example for this kind of caution. And I think it's important to hold on to that Papa's maybe, uh, Mama's baby, Papa's maybe, was an idiomatic expression that give voice to a caution. So even as we're talking about all kinds of forms of reimagining and the pleasures of, uh, that we might have in experiencing them, I think that there's also something that's at work that I that I take also as a kind of um, <laughs> a thing that I tell myself, right? That's like about not um, a, 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 about uncertainty as actually the profoundest ground in which I can stand in order to produce something like um, a, a remembering, a, 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 like a remembering or a kind of representation of these kind of historical figures who lived in these various forms of plurality. Um, I hope that I hope that gets at the the kind of question that you were you were. And I really appreciate it. And I, you know, I think in some ways that this is why um, Ra's work is so fascinating and important because I think there are also dimensions about um, the mass communication aspect that I think kind of raise. Um, these questions uh, differently than what I was hearing as um, some of the work that I think is deeply um, um, like the, the kind of experimental work that I think takes up uh, Spiller's um, invocation and and return to the notion of the kind of black female singer who's singing for herself, where the actual act of the singing is a is a kind of process for self. But but we should talk more. Anyway, I'm, I feel like I'm rambling. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I've been thinking, I, I, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot, um, probably just, just this semester and also in my work is about, is about temporality, yeah. right? Um, and, 
and and <clears throat> and then also and not just kind of temporality it's disruptions the way in which it's kind of undone right by by certain forms of being but also just by crisis right um, but I've also been thinking about the pace of time so when when time is urgent when time is inevitable anticipatory time right and so I'm trying to I'm going to ask you to to think about or to talk about Thon in relation to the pace of time or the or or the potential or putative outcome of time if it exists or if it doesn't and as I was listening to your talk I was thinking about two things in particular so I was thinking about Margaret Crawford's theorization of Finna yeah. right which yeah. okay. right <laughs> right which is a kind of time to come, but that, it, you know, and my students and I have kind of talked about this. If it's, if it's anticipated, if it's urgent, if it's inevitable, if it's uncertain and open, yeah. so that, um, but then also the not yet here of queer utopia, mm -hmm. Jose Munoz. Right. And so I wanted to ask if you could, yeah, just if we could talk about Thon in relation to these other kind of creative, um, mm -hmm. not just creative, j just these other formations of temporality in their paces and the way in which speaking to these temporalities unsettles notions of being, right, in yeah. stasis. Right, yeah, no, thank, thank you. you. That's uh, a wonderful question. And I would add my, what I have learned from you and your work on the Black aesthetic. Um, and so, <laughs> um, so, uh, one of the things that I love when digging into the notion of then is that then is not actually about the future. It's about another location, not now, um, that could imperceptibly become now, which is how I think about um, Munoz's um, the, the not yet here and yet now, or how I was also hearing um, the idea of uh, what Spillers wants for her work about, you know, like what would it take in the today for that future that Spillers wants for her work to exist? And so, um, you know, I think another, another person that is, is, is animating what I am interested in and the kind of concept of Thawne is Kara Keeling's work and uh, the essay Looking for M um, that that part of what I'm interested in is 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 in some ways playing around with the idea of pronouns as disarticulable from the personal, and like what might be opened up in that space, and some of it I actually think is about the kind of potentially like the emergence of a plurality, and so the 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 kind of then that it that may have occurred in the past or may have occurred in the future and it may be in the imperceptible now i think is why um you know i've been so drawn to uncertainty as a kind of political principle which i also think of as a principle that that like um we may want to to play with and consider in the in the realm of things that we usually call some like solidarity like i think about uncertainty as a way of bringing people together in the kind of messy ways of entanglement. Um, and so I think I've, I think I've, I think I've answered how I would answer that question, but then it, it led me into other places, which your questions always do. Thank you so much, Professor Soren. Um, first, I love you. Okay. I think <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Your work has been so foundational and formulaic to, to my thinking through of the sorts of transfigurative and shape-shifting mm. capacity of necro-politicized queer and trans subjectivity. So thank you so much. Um, I really love your, your read of, of Cuffy and sort of positing these uncertainties in order to honor opacity and pluralities of being yeah. in truth, right? Yeah. So my question has to do with the relationship between this dynamic and fugitivity. Mm. Um, and what comes to mind is 
the profound argument that you posit in, in Black on Both Sides, right? The sort of relationship between transitivity and fugitivity and the sort of um, how, the, how the mutability of gender and the rearrangeability of Blackness lends itself to fugitive practice. Yeah. So I'm wondering, um, and I'd, I'd love to hear you talk more about, about uh, Cuffey's enactment of this practice, right? Where you so beautifully note how, how Cuffey is sort of enacting this this sense of self not through uh not through a sense of belonging or or nationhood but rather to to craft and carve fugitive spaces so yeah. i i just love to hear more of an elaboration of that read thank wow. you thank you i'm um thank you like in a very profound way thank you for the question for 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 being a friend of my mind just thank you um um i I think, you know, in some ways that's like, that is the thread that's in like every project that I write is like this question about, um, there are so many things that uh, seem to prohibit movement and yet people move, right? It's the, that is the question of black on both sides. That is the question of nobody's supposed to know. That is the question. It's, it's, the, it's always a question like, what do you do with things around you to be able to make something, right? Because fugitivity, and everyone is is well aware is that like it's it's is actually escape doesn't actually have to connote movement in space movement takes all kinds of form um and you know i think about what uh like what the kind of labor that william cafe cafe williams is doing as they are moving through space, but are also moving through genders in ways that I think are also deeply about what it meant for them to make use of, um, and, and this is kind of a riff on, on I think, an insight from the, from the previous panel, but like what it, what it means for, for people, for black folks to be making their genders and making them anew and over and over again as a strategy or tool towards something like survival, you know, yeah. Thank Riley, you. Um, thank you so much. Right over here, Riley. Oh, right? hey, hey. <laughs> this is on, right? I want to thank you for your presence, your work, and your spirit. It's really beautiful. And thank the you. Academy could use much more of it, I want to say explicitly. I'm thinking about the persistence of the category and also about plurality and multiplicity. Uh -huh. And in particular, I'm thinking about um, Baldwin's proposition about the Western fascination with the category about our early misnaming that any real change, yeah. any real change implies the breakup of the world as one has always known it, yeah. the loss of all that gave one an identity, the end of what he calls safety. Yeah. He also says about this need, the American need for categorization is only corrected by what he calls new acts of creation which can save us from the evil that is in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about that as overhaul wholesale, right? Mm -hmm. A complete overturning. What he does do to connect it to this amazing figure to my left is also say that early misnaming mortifies the flesh. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about all this and everything else that's gone on today. Brilliant people, by the way, my God. Um, and I'm asking you about when you said uncertainty is the surest ground that you can stand on, mm -hmm. right? I'm thinking all the time, I'm courting all the time, a ground not yet, a clearing, right? To Say bring that one more time, I'm sorry. A ground not yet made. Yeah. Think about temporality, yeah. right? Yeah. That we might be able to inhabit if we can reimagine it over yeah. and over again. So yeah. for me, it seems as if an endless task. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, I guess I'm, I'm not yet, I'm wondering also about why the category, even in the, what, by the persistence of the category, alongside this impulse and injunction for new acts of creation? And how do we unmoor yeah. ourselves yeah. from the seduction of gender, right. even at the, the far end of the progressive inhabitation embodiment right. of non-binary, non, -binary, non you get what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, and how, yeah. do we, how do we court the end of safety, which means whiteness is gone, right? I mean, it means renaming mm. ourselves yeah. in the present yeah. and given the history that we've all shared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, um, Rich. That's a very generative question. And I want to maybe start with it. Like, w the first place that I went in my mind was, like, to think about what I think Spillers asks us to do as intellectuals, right? Which is that we move 
in ways that are about being ethical in the moment and that are about producing a set of ethical relations with no guarantee and no sense of foresight necessarily, um, at least for me. Um, I think uh, when I think about you know um, how Spillers at the level of each sentence opens up new worlds to me, it makes me think actually a lot about something that I've been really grappling with, which is like what might be meant by this plenum, yeah? Like, like that, that worlds are made and undone all the time and they still exist within a plenum is also how I think about like, what does it mean to move and generate vocabulary, which may and usually is um, appropriated, moved in different directions, um, uh, distorted, um, and uh, that that doesn't that, that that we don't bemoan right that 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 invention, and yet we also know it's time to generate some more. And I think this is this is precisely like the ways that I I imagine myself as someone who works in the archives only because I have read Spiller's theory, right? Like I like that was the way that I got into being able to do certain kinds of methodological projects because for Spillers and the model that she has given us in all kinds of iterations, um, method is an ethical practice. Method is a relational practice. And sometimes we gotta, we, there, there should, I, I, I think that we, it, it, there is something about the kind of abundance of her writing that means that even if we let one tool down, right? Like if we, we had to put one tool to the side, that there is not a sense that there's a scarcity where there's no other tools available. So what does it mean to live in gender in the kind of material, physical way that, that Spillers invites us to consider in interstices, right? It's like the kind of pluralities of, of black womanhood. Cathay William was one of my ways of trying to really just sit with that question on the ground and also know that like um, in terms of the discursive concerns that Spillers is naming and, uh, and, 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 and describing in interstices, that it's not, there's like, there, there is both the being with the pluralities that seem to be on the edge of the thing, but there's also the pluralities that exist as, as in terms of what it means to be presenting in that very moment in 1982. Um, and there is, I think, always still the kind of gesture that is like the, 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 the not yet that is also now. And, and so that's the kind of injunction, but I mean, let's like keep thinking about it. But I think like, for me, I guess to, to put it more, more succinctly, the seduction of gender, I would always ask to whom and how and when, right? And so like, there is actually, part of what I think Spillers invites us to do is actually to be like, yeah, like, I also, whenever we are embodying a thing, it has been changed. Whenever we are naming a thing, it has been changed. And those changes aren't actually necessarily revolutionary, right? But they are changes and they may move us down a certain path. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hi. I want to join the chorus in thanking you so much for your wonderful work and of course also thanking Hortense Spiller so much for oh, her nice. wonderful work. Yeah. Um, and my question uh, sort of picks up a, a tiny bit on what you just said about living in gender and also goes back to the first question about media. I work in yeah. media studies, so <laughs> queer media studies, so I'm interested in that. And was was really interested in and, and hoping, uh, interested if you have, to hear more, if you have more to say about the advertising campaign you showed about yeah. these people, period, people, people period, period, existed yeah. period, which I think in a way that's, you know, picks up on just a common thing now, especially in internet discourse of sort of inserting the periods, mm -hmm. right? And again, these people existed it's also, you know, and then it's the pictures of the characters, but they're embodied by stars. And of course the stars, you know, do really exist. So the mm -hmm. reality of the, 
Mm -hmm. stars lends a certain reality status to the characters. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's also a way of, of course, as, as you know, that in current, like even in, you know, on Twitter, in just popular culture, the status of existing in around trans right. identities now is so fraught so that right. just to give one common, if horrific example, right, you, you get these like, videos that go viral where like yeah. a, a trans person will argue with somebody like Jordan Peterson yeah. and say like, you don't think I exist. Yeah. And Jordan Peterson will say, of course I think you exist, I'm talking to you, so I know you exist. Right. And they mean two totally yes. different things by the word exist. One right. means exist, you know, as in gender in mm -hmm. a particular way. Right. And, and so I think the very status of what it means to exist, and then I think it's interesting that, you know, what you were talking about with playing with grammar mm -hmm. and how even playing with grammar can open up different possibilities and you know even putting those periods mm -hmm. in i don't know i'm just curious yeah, what yeah. you think about how that calls attention yeah to what it means to you know these people mm -hmm. exist mm -hmm. i i just would love to hear more about what you think about that yeah yeah i mean i think that that, that like there is absolutely um, like a black, like the kind of black vernacular of putting a period, sometimes period with a T, um, on the statement is meant to really heighten what's at stake in setting forth with this kind of drama. Um, I think that, you know, like the kind of idea of going to the West with real figures is, is a kind of, key and important part of what James Samuel is up to. And one that I think, you know, does heighten the kind of, well, it, it certainly um, heightens the stakes of the debate around the film itself. Um, part of what I was also interested in doing in the third part was moving away from the kind of politics of accuracy as it relates to the film, but to think more with um, kind of questions about the, the postures we inhabit when turning to the past. And I think in some ways, your, your question as it relates to the these period, people period, existed period, is also a way of marking, I think, um, the, um, the, 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 the gravity of what it means to, 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 to work to remember those things. Um, there was another piece of this that I wanted to respond to in your question, but that that's the piece that, that part was the part that I know to respond to most readily. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, so um, I am, there, there, there are two ways that I think about that. So I think about absolutely seeing that as a, um, a way of, that, that that kind of idea of trans existence for some is under consideration and debate alongside what I was also working to um, underline, I would say, which is the kind of problem of, um, of, of, a, kind of, of a kind of historical accounting wherein in the case of, for example, William Cathay, like we also are not clear about the when of their death. We're not clear about the winds of the archive in the WHE and since. So, you know, I think on the on the matter of um, you know, like the I and I keep I have to keep saying it like this, the idea of trans existence, um, you know, that that is one um that I, I, I uh, am immediately for me kind of registers as the rhetorical that somehow always precipitate or, or, or seems to want to produce the actual as a response to the rhetorical, right? Like the, the idea of trans existence produces a question about yes, one materially exists as you laid out in the kind of debate as it is structured and yet there is, I think, another kind of set of questions to be asked um, 
about about the possibility of when trans people inhabit themselves in ways that are registrable to others that in some ways brings me back to the point that I was making about uncertainty because I'm not sure if we need to wait for that legible or registrable moment. I'm instead thinking, what about the fact of uncertainty as precisely a mode of being in, in relation to trans people's existence and the idea of trans existence? Yeah. Thank you. We're gonna receive one more question. Oh, you don't wanna be the last question? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, hello, hello, my name is Greg. Um, I'm feeling a little like jittery and all of it, just from the, the 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 brilliant and beautiful thinking that's been done in this room today, um, and I'm I think I'm like overflowing with gratitude um, for all of it. So thank you to you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Spillers, for being a teacher of many of my yes. teachers, some of whom are in the room. Um, and yeah, I I think. Um, one of the comments you made in response to the last question about, um, or one of the last questions about movement um, has me thinking a lot about something I'm interested in um, as far as black queer people uh, making, making space for and of themselves um, to figure through their being. Um, and I think a lot about like space as like the cosmos and like mm -hmm. stars and celestial bodies and things like that and like using metaphors like that to yeah. think through how I might make a world for myself yeah. um, or worlds for yeah. myself. Um, and so I guess I'm also, um, let me just like find my thoughts here. Um, I wonder if you might talk more about like the perpetual motion of being and like whether you think of gender as something as, as in perpetual motion, much as like the universe is understood to be in perpetual motion. Mm -hmm. um, and along, along that line of thinking, would you think it useful to conceptualize the interstice as a space of perpetual motion for those figuring through themselves or as more of a place for, of stillness? Mm -hmm. If that, does that mm -hmm. make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, um, that question. So. Um, I think about when, when being and gender may meet as a transecting moment and why I'm so drawn to interstice, which I learned as a word from reading interstices, a small drama of words, is that you think that they intersected, but actually they didn't touch. And I love to think about that when I am teaching that or also when I'm thinking about what does it mean to inhabit and yet not be, you know? And so, um, and by which I'm referring to gender here. Um, and so I hope that kind of um, gives a sense of what I see as at work in the kind of cosmo cosmological um, um, uh, ways of, of, of forming oneself. And it actually re reminds me of like what Kiana gave to us is a poetry um, around the incandescence and mystery. Um, so I'd like to actually end with invoking that poem again. Yeah, thank you.